Chair, we're live on meet. Sorry, live on YouTube. If you'd like to go ahead and start the meeting, please. Uh, so, welcome to this uh, meeting of the partnership cabinet on the twenty fifth of October, twenty twenty three. Uh, my name is Simon Werner and I'm the uh, leader of the council and chairing this uh, meeting. The meeting's being held in person at York House, Windsor and via Zoom being streamed live to the public on YouTube. I remind all attendees in the meeting that participation indicates consent to the audio and visual being streamed live and acknowledgement that after the meeting it will continue to be available in the public domain. Um, first, I think it'll be useful for the cabinet members to introduce themselves. As I said, I'm Simon Werner and I'm the leader of the council and the council for Pink and Green. I'm Lynn Jones. <clears throat> I'm deputy leader of the council and cabinet member for finance. I'm Jeff Hill. I'm the lead member for highways, transport, customer services and employment and councillor for Oldfield Ward. Uh, Richard Coe, lead member for environmental services and councillor for Riverside Ward. Good evening, I'm Councillor Adam Boermange. I'm Cabinet Member for Planning, Legal and Asset Management. Hello, I'm Councillor Karen Davis. I'm Lead Member for Climate, Biodiversity and Winter Town Council. Catherine Del Campo, Cabinet Member for Adults, Health and Housing Services. Good evening, Joshua Reynolds, Cabinet Member for Communities and Leisure. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, now we've got one public speaker registered for this evening's meeting. Uh, sorry, up. sorry, Chair. I am here. Oh, I'm sorry. online. Hello, <laughs> Hello. sorry, Councillor Amy Teasy, lead member for Children's Services, Education and Windsor. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, so we've got one public speaker who's going to be speaking on the Sports Pavilion at Braywick Park, Manish Garg. As is my usual practice at these meetings, I'll be bringing that item to the top of the agenda after the forward plan. Um, and then another change to the agenda, we're going to bring the two Achieving for Children items up ahead as well. So that takes us on to the agenda. Do we have any apologies for absence? Uh, no apologies, Chair, but as you've seen, Councillor TZ is joining virtually, so she cannot vote, but she can participate in the debate. Fantastic. And any declarations of interest? No? OK, so is everybody happy with the minutes of the last meeting on Wednesday, the 27th of September, 2023? Great. Yeah. Fantastic. I'll now sign those and pass them on to Oren. Um, we have one appointment, um, the three churches representing the Quakers in Group A on Sacre, uh, Margaret Smith. Are we all happy for Margaret Smith to join the panel? Yeah, Fantastic. Now we'll consider the forward plan. Uh, has anyone got any items on this? Uh, Karen and Jeff, we'll start with Karen. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I've got two items um, or two things to mention. Um, on the um, Mill Lane roundabout, which is, has been removed from this evening's agenda, um, I just want to say I'm really pleased that despite the financial situation that we've inherited, um, action on Mill Lane is still on the agenda um, as a safety priority, um, particularly for cyclists. Um, and highways officers are actively reviewing alternatives, um, different solutions to try and get something installed um, a bit more quickly and easily um, for cyclist safety. So I'll look forward to that coming back on the agenda um, sort of in the near future. Um, and I had a, another item that I'd like to put on the forward plan um, for sort of maybe a, a year from now. Um, the, we've got the new air quality, the new five additional air quality um, monitors being installed very shortly. Um, and they um, measure um, PM 2.5, PM 10 and NO2. Um, and excitingly, they are going to have the... Um, uh, ability to um, report the data and be able to share it on RBWM together or somewhere like that as we go along. 
which is a new thing. So that's, I think that's really exciting. Yes. Um, air quality is something that's um, a, really, a big priority for us and it's very close to my heart. So I think that's great. And so I thought it would be a really good idea to put it on the um, agenda, maybe for a year's time and we'll have a good lot of data to um, review um, air quality management areas and the air quality improvement plan. Oh, that's fantastic, Carol. That's a really great step forward. Thank you. Uh, Jeff now. Two things for you, Chairman. One is we'd like to put the um, fees and charges paper on the forward plan for November. That's things like parking charges and other associated charges and other charges that we have throughout the borough. And number two, we'd like to move the parking strategy to June in 2024. Um, because that's coming to the corporate ONS panel for review. Uh, it'll go, go there, be reviewed, no doubt be changed, and then we'll consider it at June, no, sorry, January, January cabinet. Yeah, my J is all mixed up, my apologies. I'll do the numbers next, I did last time, wasn't it? Um, so January 2024, I can't give the officers another eight months to write it. <laughs> oh, yes, four. Okay, thank you. That's great, great. thank you. And Len? Yes, just to say that due to the council's financial situation, we will be bringing a revenue monitoring report to every cabinet. So it would be good just to have an awareness of it on the forward plan. Thank you. Yeah, that would be really good. Uh, I've got one item I'd like to add to the forward plan for next month. Uh, you're probably aware of the uh, petition that's been running for Maidenhead United Football Club asking the cabinet to reconsider their decision. So I, I'd like to bring that forward to the next cabinet meeting to review the decision and for that to be added to the uh, agenda for the meeting. OK, any other additions to the agenda? No, that's great. OK, we will now move to uh, the first item, which is now the York, York uh, which is now the leasing of sports pavilion in Braywick Park. Adam, would you like to introduce her and then we'll bring in the public speaker? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm pleased to present this report to Cabinet and propose the recommendation that we agree to enter into an agreement with Berkshire Paddle for the lease of the former sports able pavilion, uh, subject to conditions that I'll highlight later. The building has been vacant since 2021, following the surrender of the lease by the trustees of the charity when, sadly, it was wound up. Since then, the council has been liable for all outgoings of the property, including non-domestic rates, security, repairs, insurance costs, and of course, we've not been receiving any rental income for this asset. I'm sure the Cabinet are aware that there was a previous plan for the Maidenhead Heritage Centre to, pur uh, to purchase the building. However, the plan ultimately did not work out. Uh, one issue that became apparent when more extensive surveys were carried out was that there was a much bigger um, a much bigger budget would be required to make the necessary investments to bring the building into a usable standard for the long term. Therefore, uh, whilst the council has subsequently engaged with several community groups with an initial interest in leasing the building, including the Hindu Society of Maidenhead and many others, I am. And I was insistent that this took place. Uh, unfortunately, the cost of bringing the, this building back into community use, which would have had to be funded by RBWM, made such a proposal unviable. Uh, the council is simply not in a position to afford this at this time. The administration is committed to making decisions to like, ensure that we deal with the grim financial position that we have inherited. And an integral part of this commitment is ensuring that we maximise the economic as well as social value of the assets that the council owns. All things considered, I believe this proposal is the best one at this time. Paddle Berkshire are keen to lease the building and an, exter and an external area immediately behind it to enable the development of a new centre of excellence for this rapidly growing sport of paddle tennis. I admit I'm not all that familiar with the sport, but from what I've seen and heard, it's a very sociable and accessible form of the game. Uh, it's also very inclusive too. Uh, there's an adapted form of the game, for example, for wheelchair users. Braywick Park is an important venue for sports in the borough, and the borough local plan allocates the park as an open space and sports hub. The new paddle tennis club use uh, of the former sports table pavilion is therefore a good fit for this venue. It's also important that the introduction of this sport uh, does not conflict with other sports uh, sporting uses within the uh, within the uh, Braywood Park, including, of course, our own 
great big leisure centre. And I'm pleased that this, you know, that this game is sort of unique enough that it won't be, you know, taking away any of potential bookings from from our own venue. So I think that's, you know, that's important to note too. I mean, naturally, the proposal is going to be subject to um, the prospective tenant obtaining the necessary plan permission to carry out the work that they need to do uh, and also because it's going to be uh, a lease of longer than seven years it's uh, on this sort of small piece of open space immediately behind the uh, current building it will be necessary to go through the open spaces notice, notice process too. To conclude overall I believe this represents an uh, excellent deal for the council mm -hmm. and residents a minimum of at least 1.1 million pounds of rent over 20 years uh, for less than an acre of land with, sub with significant third party investment in the property. And of course, we then get to retain the asset at the end of, of that period and decide how we then reuse it. So I'd like to commend this plan to the ca cabinet at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, would Manish like to uh, speak on this? Uh, I think you've got three minutes, is it? Sorry, 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 um, Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Cabinet members. I appreciate the opportunity to address you today on behalf of the Indus Society of Marinette, a charity. At the matter at hand, item 11, regarding the leasing of this sport pavilion in Braywick Park, holds significant importance for our community. For 15 years, our society has been diligently seeking a space for a Hindu community center in Marinette. We have actively participated in the democratic process, engaging in discussion and responding to queries and expressing our concerns. Our interest in the sport pavilion has been well documented. And as the record from previous meeting confirms, we were prioritized as a second option after the Marinette Heritage Center. However, despite our relentless engagement and clear precedence, it appears that our society's concerns are being sidestepped. Our recent communications to cabinet members highlighting our reservation remains completely unanswered. We have not been involved in any kind of proactive discussions and proposals. This lack of acknowledgement, coupled with the exclusion from pivotal discussions, paints a picture of disparity. We are left feeling excluded after efforts from so many years. It is important to recognize that all religious communities in Baronet have been allotted a space. However, the Hindu society remains the only community without a designated space, creating a sense of imbalance and inequality. Apelia is for fairness, equal representation, and a fair assessment of our proposal for the sport pavilion. We are not seeking any special treatment, merely an acknowledgement that our community deserve the same rights and privileges as others. The sport pavilion represents a unique opportunity for us. It is already built, requiring no new planning permissions and aligned with our vision for a space that not only serves our community needs, but contributes positively to the culture and social fabric of Marinette. We are ready and willing to collaborate with the council to find a solution that is mutually beneficial. Our desire is to contribute to the harmonious coexistence of all religious communities in the Medinet, ensuring that every faith is afforded the same remaining. opportunities and, and rights. I ask you to consider the democratic priority assigned to us, the unique advantages of the sport pavilion, and the broader principle of equality and inclusivity in your deliberations. Together, let us build a Medinet that embraces and celebrates the diversity of its residents. I just wanted to add an additional point that I have written to cabinet member Joshua Reynolds and as well as the property uh, uh, committees, but I've got not got any response after our, my communications to them. So the engagement that has been referred is completely one sided, which is from your perspective, we have not been involved into the proper discussion or deliberations at all so far. Uh, I would like to thank you for your time and considerations. Um, thank you very much, Ban Manish. Uh, uh, obviously, I've watched how badly the H Hindu society have been treated by the previous administration over, as you, as you said yourself, 15 years. Um, it's been really quite atrocious how you've been treated. Uh, I'm really keen to meet with the society to see how we can move forward on a home for the uh, Hindu community. I, I think you're quite right. It's, it's the one face group that really hasn't been represented at the council. Um, so it would be really good if we could arrange to meet up at some point um, to discuss a, a direction that we can go that will uh, help your community and also help help Windsor remain head thrive as a multi faith community. Thank you. Uh, Josh now. 
Thanks, Simon. Um, I think it's really important to see this paper, and I'm I'm really glad that we are we're looking through options and that we've got as a council we're committed to finding the best use of our assets that we are we are committed on and we stood on our manifesto today. This deal, as Adam said, secures sixty thousand pounds worth of income for the council each year over a twenty year lease. And I think it's really great to be able to see sports groups willing to invest in Maidenhead and in sports facilities in Maidenhead at no cost to the council. Um, I've spoken in the last few days to members of the Athletics Club, the Rugby Club and the Archery Club, all at Braywick Park. And although there are some concerns that they still have with some of the with the, some of the proposal, I think it's really important. And I'm really glad that recommendation three allows the executive director of place to consult with the Braywick Park user group for their views and for any small change which might need to be made to make everything fit together. And I'm hoping to be able to go and see and, and speak to the Braywick Park user group on the 21st of, of November. Um, thank you, Manesh, for, for speaking. I know we've obviously, we've had a meeting, we've had several phone call and email discussions over the past few months about plans and thoughts. I think from, from the council, we're really committed to helping the Hindu Society find finding new homes. So I'm glad that you, you're gonna meet with them as well, because I think there's, there's a really good opportunity that we've got here. It might not be that Sports Able, the old Sports Able building is the right place, but actually, I think there is somewhere in Maidenhead we can make this work, and I'm really glad that we're committed to making it do so. Thank you. Uh, anybody else, Jess? Yeah, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. Most of it's already been said. Um, I'm the um, count on the councils for Oldfield Ward. This is in Oldfield Ward. I'm delighted to see the building coming back into. Um, active use. I, I do sympathise with the, the Hindu society and I'm, I'm delighted that both the leader and Councillor Reynolds are going to help you because it's it's overdue and uh, you've sort of been passed over by the previous administration and that won't happen here. Um, coming back to this building, I'm delighted to see it back in productive use because it's, it's a good building and uh, buildings are there to be used. So I'm delighted someone's prepared to take it on. I'm also will make the point that I'm very delighted with the nature of the deal that's been done. I notice that um, it's 60,000 a year. And when we compare what the uh, <coughs> Liberal Democrat independent uh, administration is doing uh, compared to the previous Conservative administration, we get literally double the money for the borough in 20 years, as opposed to half the money um, in 990 years. Uh, for the site opposite, which is the uh, athletics track, which uh, there'll be a debate on that next, uh, coming to the next cabinet in November. So well done, good deal, stacks up financially and puts uh, an innovative new sport in the borough. So I'll go down and have a look. I doubt where I have a go, but I'll go down and have a look. Thank you. Uh, Lynn. Yes, given our financial situation, yeah, I'm very pleased with the deal that's been made, but I also am very pleased that bringing the building up to scratch won't actually cost us any money uh, because at the moment we haven't got the money to do that. So overall, what with income and having a functioning building, I think this is a very good decision. Thank you. So hands up those people who are going to try paddle tennis. <laughs> One, two. Excellent. Well done. <laughs> OK, so is that all agreed, everybody? Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to uh, the first of the Achieving for Children papers, the annual report. Um, we have Amy online, uh, Cabinet Member for Children's Services, Education and Windsor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to start with a little bit of background information, particularly for members of the public who might be watching and, and not necessarily um, fully up to date with what AFC actually is. Um, AFC Achieving for Children is a community interest company, which is actually jointly owned by RBWM and the boroughs of Richmond and Kingston. They provide all our children's services, which includes things like early help, um, support for families um, through to statutory services, fostering adoption, all of those types of issues, as well as schools um, uh, and, and all of that and, uh, and SEND as well. Um, it has been recognised that perhaps 
the council didn't have the best oversight of AFC, but this paper is part of our new um, drive to really make sure that the council know exactly what's happening with our with our partners in AFC, um, as well as a new um, oversight ownership board um, and regular directors meetings it just makes sure that we we have the best grip on what's what's going on and that will ensure the best outcomes for our children and young people and also delivering value for money to the council so this report contains an impact report it gives a real overview of the priorities and the achievements of AFC and it shows some key performance indicators for example, we've had a joint targeted area inspection, which focused on the single point of access. That's where referrals come in. And that was very positive. Um, Department of Education recently removed our written statement of action because it was clear that AFC had made clear and sustained progress. Um, the school nurse and health visiting team recently received a really good uh, QCQ rating. Our youth offending services received a good inspection and so on. And, and it, it's all these kind of measures that show how AOC are doing a good job for us. Um, some of the other key strengths that Cabinet, I would just like you to note, is the focus on early help services. Now, personally, that's something I'm really passionate about. And we know that the early intervention when a family is struggling is really important because it will hopefully reduce the risk of, of statutory intervention later on. Um, our holiday offer, fuel for children who are entitled to free school meals, is going from strength to strength, uh, helped 832 children to do holiday activities and have a, a decent meal during 2022. And then recently, our um, emotionally related school avoidance, unfortunately, has been increasing since um, COVID. And, and that's been a real issue since the pandemic. So we have a project um, to give training and support to schools to help um, to, um, them to work on that. Um, and AFC are also working hard to provide the very best offer for children with so, um, special educational needs and disabilities. And the Send Voices Parent Carer Forum is growing in popularity. And I would really recommend to parents um, with children with Send to, to join them online. Um, so after that, the, the other part of the report is the equality, diversity and inclusion. And that just sets out exactly what AFC knows about its own workforce, um, its service users and how it intends to improve EDI through training and, and, and awareness of these issues. And then finally, we have the accounts, which contains information about the financial performance and position of AFC, and it shows it to be a, a going concern. Also acknowledging the unique um, the unique style of it because it's a not-for-profit community interest company and, and some of the, the things that come about because of that. Um, really, just to summarise, I'd just like to thank the People Overview and Scrutiny um, panel for their comments and questions um, when this paper went to them before coming to Cabinet. Um, it's really useful to have their impact at that early stage um, and so we can, we can take those comments into um, into consideration. So, um, Cabinet, I would just like you to please um, note the report um, and, and, and that's it. Thank you very much, Amy. Now, we actually have the Chief Operating Officer of uh, uh, Achieving for Children here. Uh, Lucy, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think Amy's actually summarised the reports really well. Um, I think, you know, we hopefully the reports demonstrate that actually there there is some really, really good impact to the work that we've done with children and young people um, in Windsor and Maidenhead over the last year. Um, that's sort of demonstrated by the inspection results, but well, also by kind of some of the really key programmes um, that we can see are really, really having an impact. Um, on the annual report and accounts, just to note that um, as a joint owner of ASC, the council jointly appoints independent auditors. Um, so our auditors are Crow, um, and they have completed the audit on those accounts and have confirmed that they present a true and fair view of financial performance and position. So they've been um, submitted to Companies House for publication. But thank you for the opportunity to speak. No problem. Thank you, Lucy. Um, has anyone got any questions or comments to make? Or can um, we... Just that I was—I was, I, was uh, I think you said 850 children on three school meals participated in the summer program. And I just think you know, it's just a terrible highlight of the level of child poverty in our country at the moment. Absolutely. Um, okay, can we agree this paper, Adam? 
Yeah, I just wanted to make yeah, just a very quick question about um, yeah, just basically looking forward to the current year and you know to understand you know taking you know the achievements that have been made in in the year that we've just reviewed. What you know, what are the top kind of priorities for you know for the current year? Where where do you, where do you see that the most work is is needed, and where you know where, what it, you know what are the kind of sort of the main yeah your sort of main goals for for the current year? I know there's a, obviously there's a there's a, a multi year um, a multi year uh, plan, but sort of in the in the immediate term, what are the yeah what are the sort of key key um, areas that you're working on? If I start, and Lynn may want to come in, Lynn obviously oversees um, sort of frontline services within Achieving for Children. Um, but I'd say, broadly speaking, I mean, I think the work will continue to support families and young people through the cost of living crisis. I think that is still very much alive. And, you know, there's a lot of work to do, not just in the school holidays, actually, but kind of all year round to make sure that they have the kind of support and guidance that they need. Um, we're also doing a lot of work in our early health services, um, particularly with young people who are perhaps sort of on the edge of care to make sure, again, that we are intervening early um, to stop needs um, escalating into statutory services. Um, and then I guess the third one is around SEND, so special educational needs. We know the number of children um, who will need education, health and care plans will continue to rise. Um, so it's really important that we continue to focus on making sure that we've got a really good quality and right local offer that's both affordable but also provides those children with the, the sort of help that they need um, and a lot of that is working with schools and other partners in health to make sure as I say that the local offer is strong but also families really really know about it. Um, Lynn Ferguson Executive Director of Children's Services and Education. I agree with everything that's been said there are just two areas I'd like to add if that's okay Chair. One is um, working with children who are not school ready. We are seeing an increase in children coming into primary school because of COVID, not ready, not able to socialise, um, not wanting to share. Teachers are having a real problem with that age group. So we have got a number of projects in place um, to support those children identified as not ready for school. And then the other area is um, emotionally related school avoidance. Young people who since COVID um, are, are struggling with the confidence to be able to attend school. So those are two other key areas that I just add to what um, Lucy has said. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Amy, do you have anything to add or should we go to the... Um, no, I think those extra points absolutely echo what I would say. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, if that's all agreed, everybody. Yes. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the Achievement for Children contract. Amy. Thank you, Chair. And so leading nicely on from um, looking at AFC's performance, we have a, a paper here to which the recommendation is that we approve um, an extension of our contract with AFC for a further five years. Um, the current contract has been running will have been running for seven years is up for renewal in in uh, 2024 um, and we have the option to extend as I said for five years so officers had a look at three possible options um, and identified them and looked at uh, considered them in terms of uh, quality value for money and and in relation to the current performance of AFC so option one is to extend the contract. Option two would be to bring services, children's services in-house. Um, and option three would be to undertake an open market tender for a new provider. Now, the recommendation is to extend the contract for five years. Um, the current model, as we've seen, is working well. It's delivering value for money and it's delivering good value, uh, good quality children's services. We benefit from partnership working with Richmond and Kingston. Um, as we're part owners, we can claim VAT on the cost of services. That's that's one small benefit there. Um, and many of the measures of success have already been mentioned tonight. So um, it is considered that bringing services in-house or tendering would be extremely disruptive, uh, costly, and it could take staff focus away from the children and young people, which would be could, could be a real risk. Um, you know, AFC is delivering high quality services for our children and young people. And that's even more um, impressive, really, considering that actually when you benchmark us against other local authorities, I think we're at something like the 10th lowest spending authority in England. So we're really, we're really 
doing the best with uh, you know limited resource and and delivering very high quality services. Um, so with the renewed focus on the oversight of AFC from officers and members, I'm I'm confident that this is the best option to renew. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, anybody want to speak or are we happy? Oh, there. Um, just to say that I'm very pleased to see that all options were actually considered in this paper to provide the services. Um, not only is it excellent value for money, but it's also of a good standard. Um, so, yes, I, you know, I do agree with the paper and the recommendation, but the, the fact is that we have actually considered all options before making this decision. Thank you very much. Okay, if we can agree that, everyone in agreement? Agreed. Fantastic, thank you very much. So we'll move on. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, okay, we'll just move on to the next item. Just some something we missed off forward plan. I'd like to invite uh, uh, Ewan. You've got something you'd like to raise on the forward plan. Lucy, you can go or you can stay for the meeting if you like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure whether it's to do with the forward plan, but. We'll try. I'll remind you that I'm your appointed representative on the Thames Regional Flood and Coastal Committee. In January, I have to raise my hand with another dozen other councillors who represent the entire uh, Thames, uh, Thames Valley, no, Thames Valley, Thames catchment area to spend something in excess of one hundred million pounds for a year. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure that you ever knew that, but that's done every year. The, the total is, I think, something like five billion pounds over a six year uh, for all the regional flood and coastal committees in this country, but it's an enormous sum. Okay, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we passed a motion this council supports the actions being taken by the cabinet and senior leadership, et cetera, et cetera, and agrees all councillors need to take responsibility for ensuring the council does all it can to increase its financial sustainability. So I have alarm bells ringing, uh, 400,000 pounds, 20234, CD54, River Thames Scheme Infrastructure, and 20245, also CD54, River Thames Scheme Infrastructure Project, 450 million pounds. I have alarm bells ringing because this project, Channel One, River Thames Scheme Channel One, was removed from the River Thames Scheme over three years ago. Okay, so I'll leave you to, to consider that one. When I look at, <clears throat> when they took out the uh, River Thames Scheme Channel One, they put in another one uh, to try and sort of uh, close the gap between the Jubilee River and the Maiden Midwinter and Eaton Flood Alleviation Scheme uh, and the new River Thames Scheme, this channel one. They tried to put in uh, Datchet to High Then flood improvement measures. So that's been going for years. So I have the latest report straight off the web. And when you look in, in there, what it says is, Previously included in Channel One, etc. However, Channel One was unfortunately, unfortunately, neither viable nor deliverable without either additional funding or greater flexibility sought over council tax. There's loads of stuff. Like. Bottom line: the councils, and that's talking about you, original commitment of ten million pounds is still ring fenced to contribute to alternative flood alleviation works. Now, I am asking you whether that ten million pounds is real, is here now, or whether you're going to load it onto your existing 203 million pound debt. I then went to look at the debts of the other councils, uh, particularly in Surrey. When you look at the debt to uh, income uh, ratio, we're looking at Spellthorne. Now Spellthorne happens to be next to Datchet Hortner Raysbury. Spellthorne, 1.1 million pound debt, 
at an 86 times income ratio. They are top of the list. Woking, 1.97 billion debt, and they are 62 times income. We go on down, uh, the fourth one down is Runnymede, 643 million pounds debt, uh, 23 times income. So our debt isn't very much when you compare it with those. Then the Surrey Heath, uh, 170, which is 13. Point seven times and Rushmore, 120 million, uh, 10 times debt. I am concerned that Surrey will not be able to afford their 230 million pound contribution to the River Thames scheme, plus another 40 million for every other flood defence scheme um, in Surrey. Now, this is a geo geopolitical problem, and Datchet, Horton and Raysbury have been just abandoned, left in the middle between a flood alleviation scheme that was created 20 years ago that simply dumps water onto an undefended ward downstream and further on downstream. Um, and um, a, new, a new scheme uh, after the Floods and Water Management Act called Partnership Funding, where whoever conceived it, and it must have been a conservative uh, administration of some sort, said, oh, we want to build bigger, better flood alleviation schemes. Let's have a contribution from the local councils and the businesses. Well, if you're rich and wealthy and you can afford to do it, then you get on and do it. That scheme was never envisaged to be used to stop flood alleviation schemes being built. So well, here we are, 2008, all the schemes moving forwards. Uh, 2011 partnership funding comes in. Um, 2015, somebody sets up a little committee in a back room somewhere that somebody from this council, maybe not here, maybe not sitting here now, attended and uh, agreed that this council would put the money in, in 2015. But as time went on, it got less and less likely. Now, when I was first appointed to the, yeah, sorry, when I was first appointed to the Thames Regional Flood and Coastal Committee, I started asking questions about this money. And I was taken off after the first year. I was a four year appointment I had, and I asked questions and I was taken off. And those people who took me off know who they are. Anyway, is the 10 million pounds available? That's all <laughs> I'm asking because in a, in, January, yeah. I will be standing there and saying I am not prepared to support another £20 million on top of £70 million that has already been spent and we're still only in the development stage and haven't got a development consent order. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, my understanding very much is uh, that the £10 million is still a commitment by the Council. It doesn't appear in the budget at all and, and, and wasn't in the budget last February. But it, it, it's still a, a, a general commitment the council's made. I mean, thank you, Ewan, for all you do, for you, all you do on the flooding issue. I mean, your your knowledge of all the issues is encyclopedic yeah. and of huge value to the. Uh... Well, Absolutely right. And uh, I think it'd be really good if me and Lynn met with you to discuss some of the issues around the money, because it's a really important issue. But thank you ever so much for coming. It's re it really is appreciated. Keep up the good work, Ewan. Okay, so moving on, uh, we now have uh, the quarterly assurance report uh, for quarter one. This is very much a new approach to performance management, uh, where the cabinet will now be scrutinising performance against targets on a quarterly basis, alongside the council's major risk audit, risks and audit report outcomes. This is part, very much part of a new, improved approach to good governance and transparency that's been sadly missing over the last 16 years. So not only is the cabinet going to be scrutinising the budget position, on now a monthly basis, as uh, Lynn's already said, uh, in a public meeting, we'll also be publicly discussing council performance and risk management. As part of this, we'll be also be asking the Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Committee to consider this quarterly performance report and go into further details so that we can really scrutinise our, our performance. Acknowledging what's going well, yes, 
and looking at how we can improve those areas that need improving. So just a minor change to the second recommendation on this, to, to read that it asks the overview and scrutiny to consider the quarterly performance reports and identify areas where we can improve. We, we can't obviously tell the scrutiny panels what they need to look at. That's got to be completely up to their decision, but we can certainly make suggestions to them and it's up to them whether they take them or not. Okay, does anyone have anything to say about this? Uh, Lynn? I think this is a major step towards increased transparency and it's welcome. I think, you know, as, and as cabinet, we've said we want to provide a more transparent face to our residents. Um, I'd like to see maybe a better focus on what we need to address um, so that we can utilise it and uh, scrutiny can utilise it and understand a bit more about the context. For instance, complaints and uh, compliments, you, we need to understand what's behind that. You know, is every missed bin a complaint? We need to know how that's affected. Um, yes, but it's transparent, and that's what we said we were going to do, and we're doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Josh? Thank you, Simon. Um, I think what you said at the beginning of that item is really powerful in terms of our new approach to assurance management. Um, like Lynn said, openness and transparency were at the top of the agenda. And I think not only us as cabinet, but I'd, I'd hope, and there are some non-cabinet members sat watching the meeting, I'd hope that every councillor would agree with, with those wise words and would agree wholeheartedly this is the right thing for us to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross. Uh, any other comments, Richard? Um, I think, you know, there's more than just the um, residents being able to see what they're getting for their money. Openness and transparency is also a really good way of driving improvement in the service delivery. And, you know, at the moment we have some services that are maybe not delivering and we need uh, residents to be able to communicate with us and us with them fully what's going on so we can drive that improvement that we all want. Absolutely right, Richard. Okay, so can we uh, agree that paper? Agreed. Um, thank you very much. We're now moving on to the month five revenue monitoring report. Lynn again. Thank you. Um, Yes, as said, been said previously, um, there's at month five, there's an overspend of services of 7.312 million, uh, which reduces if we use a contingency um, to 3.589. I'm not going to go through the whole paper, but I just want to pick up a few items. Um, we've been briefed, it's come to cabinet and the briefing has been repeated in three separate sessions attended by members of all parties with an opportunity to ask questions. So we are being very transparent again. Um, the main pressures are outlined, costs and usage and demand-led services, higher than expected inflationary increases, and cost of servicing debt remains a key concern. But I want to really say that we are already making a difference. The spending control panel has been established. Uh, monthly reviews of the financial position are given to the leadership team and to cabinet. And both cabinet and council have agreed their support to resolve this situation. So the medium term financial plan agreed in February 23 assumed the council would deliver sustainable savings over the medium term and remain above the minimum level reserves. Unfortunately, there are over two million pounds worth of savings included in the February budget that appear to be not achievable. So that's one area we've got to look at. Um, we have established a rigorous planning panel process to review potential nuclear placements and we've got the home first project that seeks to support people as they leave the hospital. There are indications that these are having positive impacts. Um, we are scrutinizing the service around SEN appeals to ensure any eligible young people are offered transport. We've got increased contract management working with the, within the existing contract frameworks. They are identifying cost savings 
which are also informing future procurements. We've got an improvement of parking income, um, communications campaign to increase parking use in key locations appears to be working. We have got a debt, um, but that is an area of high focus and there has been additional resource put into that and we seem to be making progress with that. And the clear and frequent reporting of debt to encourage directorates to engage in the debt recovery process seems to be making good progress. Um, we're also reviewing the billing processes and collection of current debtors because it's important to improve early collection so that the problem does not reoccur. It's no good doing, you know, recovering old debt if we aren't recovering new debt. Uh, the capital programme, in light of the situation, you know, there was an urgent need to reduce borrowing costs. And so all capital schemes are currently under review with the intention of removing the financial burden of additional borrowing costs where possible. And again, good progress is being made on that. We, you, know, you need to note that 20 million borrowed and we're paid over 20 years at current rates is an additional revenue cost of 1.5 million a year. So that is where why we need to keep our borrowing down and try to reduce. I think that's most of it. Um, we are making inroads into the in-year deficit and some of these changes implemented already will impact in 24-25. And as I said, the spending review panel has had an immediate impact across departments, um, a change of approach to bring down this unnecessary spend. So if we look at the recommendations, it's basic to note situation we're in and note our approach to in-year budget monitoring and strengthening and we've also got to agree the environments bear with me because i'll go through that these are only accounting environments we're not um moving anything around budgets oh god bear with me Right, the budget environments. So we have movement within adult social care to bomb the EMA reserve to mitigate the care passage costs. Um, also, budget would be moved from the contingency budget to cover a pressure in the coroner's service. And then within commercial investment property portfolio, we're basically combining two projects. And then there is a transposition error where uh, money was put towards the affordable housing in St Edmunds, when it should be affordable housing 16 Ray Mill Avenue East. So they're all accounting and they don't uh, mean that we are doing any additional spend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. A uh, very sobering picture. Well done for your work on that to improve the situation. Um, any other comments from anybody? Uh, Jeff? I'll add a few, a few things in very briefly. Uh, Lynn mentioned about parking income. My lead member briefing today on parking income. The good news is that we're 532,000 up year to date on last year. So we're actually doing very, very well. Um, in terms of the campaign that Lynn mentioned as well, we've been running a com comms campaign to tell everybody where car parks are <clears throat> and in, in sort of enthuse people to use our car parks in winter and May throughout the community. 
and um, it is it is actually working uh, in places like Vickers Way that have been heavily advertised because the utilisation is, is terribly low. Um, we've had another 500 uh, people park there, so another 500 cars have been in there. Parking usage is up in Hines Meadow, Staffordton Way, and our surface car parks throughout the borough. So the comms campaign has worked. And even the little campaign of £10 for the weekend in Vickers Way, we've got five takers for that. <clears throat> I know that's not very big, it's only £50, but it does, you know, the word gets round. So we'll run the campaign again um, next year sort of January, February, we'll give another break and then we'll run it again and we'll keep running it throughout next year. And <clears throat> it will build momentum. It does show that when you tell people it's out there, people do use it. And the residents' um, parking discount scheme, there has been a very big uptake of that. In fact, I've forgotten the numbers. I did write them down but there's been a big increase in the number of residents going on to Ringo and getting their discount cards. So it is actually pulling, pulling people in because residents get an hour it's free parking at the moment when they use Ringo. So there's that. Um, <clears throat> the other side that is starting to have a, a proper effect as well is the collection of adult social care debt. Um, I know our, our debt's about 5.3 or 5.8. I mean, I forget the exact number. It's so big. But we've actually eaten into it. The two two new people there have only been there a couple of weeks. Um, they pulled in £100,000 and they're just starting to get going. So the debt's going. It's going the right way. It's going down instead of moving up. So we're managing to collect that. And as Lynn rightly says, we're invoicing sooner and we're collecting our debt sooner. So we're holding that stable, plus we're starting to reduce it. Uh, which is very good. And the debt's been broken up into various grades of debt. The letter's been sent out to solicitors. Solicitors are doing collections. So it's all started to move in the right way. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, any other questions, comments? Uh, Richard? Well, I just think £100,000 in two weeks' work sounds quite good stuff. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and emphasizes the shocking nature of five million pound age that's going back 10 years. Shocking, mm. shocking performance. Um, okay, uh, if we're all happy, Adam. Yeah, I just wanted to just comment. Uh, no, I really uh, appreciate bringing this paper forward uh, for this meeting, and also, you know, the fact that we're now committed to bringing forward um, a paper at each cabinet meeting um, you know, on a monthly basis. I think it's, you know, obviously, we've, we've highlighted. Great detail, yeah. The, the financial situation and the issue uh, that we face. So it's really important that we keep a close eye on things. I mean, hopefully, you know, when we did get next month's report, uh, I know it'd be a fairly early days, but you know, with all the uh, you know the, the sort of work that, and you know recovery plan that we've discussed, I'm hoping that we might see the early signs that we things are moving in the right direction. I just well, I'll put that out there, and hopefully, uh, yeah. <coughs> Uh, would see what see where things are moving. Yeah. Um, early indications are that you know we will see it moving in the right direction. Um, I'm very confident in officers in the steps that they are implementing to to bring down um, the overspend this year, and of course transfer that into the, the same savings into next year. So I am becoming increasingly more confident than I was two months ago. <laughs> well done, Lynn. That's fantastic. Um, OK, is that all agreed, everybody? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, OK, we'll move on to the uh, A308 Hollyport Road Junction Improvements. Jeff. Thank you. Oop, nearly lost the glass of water. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. I'll keep... This one quite brief, it's uh, quite a straightforward thing. Um, first off, the um, the junction at Hollypool Road, I think we all we all know it very well, it's on the Hollypool Road, the A308, just the Windsor side of the A4, of, sorry, A4, M4, of the M4 bridge. Um, <clears throat> that roundabout is in urgent need of an upgrade. Um, 
I've had near misses on it, and most people I speak to have had near misses on it. We've had traffic cameras on it, um, <clears throat> showing that it is it is a hazard to, to drivers, and there are near misses every day of the week because the, the road is actually very, very straight on the A308, so the temptation is to drive straight on because the deflections on the A308 part of the roundabout are very, very, very small, so it doesn't slow the traffic to definitely doesn't slow the traffic down uh, there was there's been a thorough investigation with this and there's been a consultation the consultation is on the website as part of the part of the cabinet papers the the public have expressed an interest in a roundabout they don't want traffic lights um, we get that we do get that and uh, with the traffic modeling that's been done it turns out that a reduced size roundabout, not reduced on what it is, but not not a full roundabout, but a smaller roundabout, but uh, an upgrade to the existing one actually works better than traffic lights. The traffic flows actually faster with uh, what's called a reduced roundabout than the existing than uh, traffic lights would, would would flow. So coming on to money because money is horribly tight. It's 1.3 million pounds, but the money is coming from the Berkshire Local Enterprise Partnership as Housing Sites Enabling Fund of 1 million pounds and the Community Infrastructure Levy of 300,000 pounds. The upgrade to the roundabout is necessary to keep that junction serviceable up to 2033 and beyond, because very obviously there is a lot of building work taking place and that traffic light, that traffic goes on the work on the road somewhere and it goes down that road. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Um, the recommendation is that Cabinet notes the report and approves the installation of a compact roundabout. That's the correct word, compact, not small or mini, compact roundabout at the junction of the A308 Windsor Road with the Hollyport Road and delegates authority to the service lead for transport to finalise the detailed designs. Obviously, if we get approval tonight, then it goes to the, uh, the highways engineers to finalise the detailed designs. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Josh? Thank you, Simon. Um, I think picking up on what Councillor Hill said about the consultation, Actually, I think that's really important to see that in March, February, March, the plan was for traffic lights. And the most common comment was that people didn't want traffic lights. And the second most common comment was people would like a different roundabout there. Yeah. And actually, what better example of a council listening to its residents and listening to the feedback that people give it than doing exactly what residents have asked for and implementing this change? I, I just think it's a fantastic show of us as a council listening to our residents and doing what our residents want us to do and getting after the important issues that they've got. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. OK, if everybody's happy, we'll agree that paper. Yes, thank you very much. And we'll now move on to, ah, right, York Road phase one, I think, is the next paper. Um, as we've been talking about in, in this agenda, we've put together a rescue plan for the finances of the council, following quite a lot of poor decision making in the past. And we're determined to get best value from all of our assets, rather than just selling off cheap. I still cringe at the sort of the uh, amount of money we sold the old Magnet Leisure Centre site for. Yeah. Now, this might be a, the right solution in this paper. However, we would like to send the paper back to come back to the next meeting of the Cabinet with more options, which would include keeping the units and renting them out rather than just selling them off. I'm not prejudicing the um, uh, decision because we, we might go with what's suggested in the paper. But I think, you know, our assets are our, fam, uh, our crown jewels, aren't they, really? And we need to make sure we're making them best from them that we possibly can. So if this could be brought back to the next meeting so that we can really make an evidence-based decision and look after our council assets properly. Thank you. Uh, Adam? Yeah, thank you for that, Simon. Uh, no, absolutely uh, yeah, agree with what you say. Um, yeah, more than happy to you know, take the paper away, um, go, go back, um, speak with our officers. And uh, like you, as you quite rightly say, I think it would be good to Look at uh, some, you know, potential other options uh, in this case. Obviously, you know, we've, we've 
uh, you know, there's an ongoing theme when it comes to our assets that we, yeah, we really want to make the best decisions. And sometimes those are difficult decisions, which uh, will make some people happier than others. But we, you know, we're, we're taking, you know, we're, we're taking a strategic view here. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely, I uh, think, yeah, having a bit more time to look at uh, potential, uh, yeah, potential for better, uh, you know, better options there is a, is a really good idea. So I uh, no, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Just uh, quickly supporting supporting you, Simon. I think we've seen very clearly from tonight with uh, the work that uh, Councillor Reynolds and Councillor Ramonge have done on the the um, the old um, sports able pavilion, um, getting sixty thousand pounds a year rent um, is a prime example of actually going through the problem and really take you know looking at it from a number of different angles and getting the residents of the borough a, good, a very very good deal. It's in uh, complete contrast to the previous administration with the site opposite uh, when they pretty much gave it away. Um, and I take the point about the magic, mag magic, <laughs> the mag magnet uh, leisure center. It was an appalling deal. So in the same vein as the leader, not prejudiced against uh, what's in the paper, but certainly we need some more options to make sure we get the very best for the public because um, that hasn't been done in the past and it's certainly not going to happen with this administration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any other comments? No, okay. Uh, we can agree that change. Agree. Uh, and I think that's the end of the uh, agenda. We sort of moved it around a bit, but I can't see any items I've missed. So no, we'll finish the meeting.